Okay. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Weight Research Institute seminar for this week. Um, this week, we welcome Nina Welty from CSIRO Agriculture and Food, who will be speaking to us about designing an integrated provenance system for agricultural products. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, yeah, so I'm Nina Welty. I work in agriculture and food at CSIRO. I'm based here at the Weight. Um, I'm a biogeochemist by trade, so that means I'm a jack of all trade and mistress of none. Um, I find myself uh, in this provenance world by accident, uh, but I've been in this accident for the last five, four years or so. So at some point, it's just gonna be my job. Um, so we're gonna take, we're gonna act as a sleuth today, put our Sherlock Holmes caps on. And we're going to investigate the great Hong Kong cherry heist of 2021. So earlier this year, a Hong Kong customs agent seized um, about $13,000 worth of cherries marketed as Tasmanian brand 43 degrees south. So these, cher these 400 kilos of cherries, their kilo price is about 33 bucks per kilo. I've never spent that much on cherries. Um, they're not dipped in gold. They're just, this was um, the beginning of the Lunar New Year. Uh, uh, celebrations and these cherries are highly prized as, as gifts for this time of year. Um, but we're going to ask ourselves a few questions. Why, why were these cherries so valuable? Why do you think they're valuable? Um, where did this substitution occur? How, how did this happen? And how can we prevent it in the future? So this is going to be our, our lens for the day. I know in the abstract I promised I would talk about wine, grain, seafood and another product, but we're going to talk about cherries today. Um, so with that in the back of our mind, why do you pay premium prices? So when was the last time you bought something, say perhaps you decided to buy Parmesan cheese instead of a Becca block of tasty cheese or something instead of something. Why did you do that? And this is the audience participation part. Of <laughs> it's very different from a you know, tasty cheese. It's a specific cheese. So it's a, the taste yeah, of the cheese? Yeah, uh, you know, the structure and everything. Okay. Yeah. And I know and how it behaves when you add it in food. Yeah, so the product, the constituent ingredients would make it up and the properties it has. Which way to the fermentation and where that comes from as well, the problem. Yeah, so, so where it came from. So is it a Parmigiano from Parma versus a Parmigiano from? You cannot call it anything else Parmigiano. It's, it's origin. Other, otherwise, it's a hard cheese. <laughs> uh, anybody other than cheese? Anybody? Yep. Milk. Milk. What's your milk that you buy? Only Pangarina dairies. Versus? Whatever it is, two dollars a. A litre in gold. So what's the price difference? Two dollars a litre versus three bucks. So that's a fair, fair price increase. Motivation for that is supporting local farmers. And why do you want to support the local farmers? Regularly visit the landscape in which they sit. So you... I'm obviously connected with agriculture myself. Yeah, so the, is it the agricultural practices that you know these farmers take or is it... No, just a, a local small business. Works out at six dollars a week difference ultimately. Yeah. It's trivial to me, it makes a difference to a liter of petrol, right? <laughs> <laughs> Any anyone else? Rye bread, is that anybody's thing? I buy rye bread. <laughs> I knew you would. <laughs> it's a really tough topic, so let's <laughs> I made memmi over the weekend, making memmi this weekend. So, we <laughs> um, so yeah, these, these premium prices. So we, if we go back to our cherries, why do you think these Hong Kong cherries were, had such a high street value, $33 a kilo? What, why do you think the cust there was a, a customer out there willing to pay this price? 
So the production so process. How it looks like, and if it's meant to be a gift, then the price is not really, it's not food anymore, it's a gift. Yep. But also to get reputation, we talk about those other products, you know, where it comes from, clean, green, environment, all these sorts of things. So the product region, so the fact that it's from Tasmania, the production process, it's in a nice package. It's a gift, it's not really food at this point, but it's it's been produced in this kind of niche premium way. Um, you mentioned the welfare practices and the farming practices. So the, the producers, like your milk producers, they're earning a living wage. The pack houses are safe. We can, you know, be, we can assume, or we assume that because it's coming from Australia, that it's meeting these welfare standards and that the farming practices are meeting environmental standards. Perhaps it's water wise or um, placed well in the landscape and there's a stewardship involved with these. And you took it already out of my mouth that these are all related to, this is the description of provenance. So all of these characteristics, the, pro, the production region and processes and the standards of what a product meets, that describes a provenance of a product. So this is a, a, a really simplified supply chain. We have a farm, the products get moved on farm to a processing facility, uh, packaged, sent to a retailer, and then they're consumed. And what underpins this supply chain is trust. So we trust in Australia that our, our food is safe, it's sustainable, it's equitable, um, and we, we trust the system. Uh, this trust is extended to Australia as an exporting nation. So um, when we have exporting agreements with other countries, the Australian domestic standards are seen as high enough, so they're uh, allowed to enter an, a new market without undergoing new regulation because the Australian uh, system is trusted globally. We can trust, but we should verify. Um, this was something famous that Reagan said in the 80s. Um, whether you, whatever you think of Reagan, let's park it. <laughs> but um, if we verify our trust as scientists, we can be happy that, that we know what we're getting and what's on the, what's on the label is what is the product. Um, but how do we do this at a shopping center? So in, this, in the aisle, so this is my grocery list for the week. I've got some bananas. Uh, I want mascarpone and mozzarella. I've got a tiramisu and some pizza I'm making. I want real balsamic vinegar because I'm gonna put a tomato salad next to it. Um, and cinnamon because I'm probably gonna make bula and I need to make sure my, my cinnamon is of a high quality and from a sustainable source. But how do I, as the consumer standing in the aisle, I don't have access to a lab to verify these things that my cinnamon has been harvested sustainably or that my mascarpone is in fact Italian. What, what do we do when we're shopping? We look at the brands. You look at the brands? The labels. So we use all these labels. We look at Australia made, made in the USA, Hellstar ratings. So after price, country of origin is the most important uh, decision-making label on a food, pro food product. Um, then it's ingredient list and follow that is nutrition. And then after that are the welfare standards. So we use country of origin often as a proxy for these welfare standards because you know, vegan, Rainforest Alliance, certified palm oil free, ethically sourced, these, they are standards, but they're not maybe as um, standardized <laughs> standards as Australian made. So if something's Australian made, we would use that as a proxy to say, oh, it is ethically sourced. The farmers are getting a living wage. They are meeting uh, welfare uh, standards and pack houses and production facilities. There's not going to have unethical labor um, we're going to pay attention to landscape and um, deforestation and all of these other standards that we may care about as a consumer. But we can't verify this in the aisle, so we just have to trust the label. So when we use labels, we're really talking about food traceability. So this follows the product using uniquely identifying packaging. 
And verified provenance is independent confirmation using measurable, measurable characteristics. So this is using the product itself to define what it is and not the packaging. So this is a, a small but very important distinction between a food tracing system and a, a, a provenance system. So in the case of our Tasmanian cherries, it was the fake QR codes that alerted the producers to the fraudulent activity. So they had a hologram on their QR code. The fake cherries did not have that hologram on the QR code. So it was, um, that's how they realized that there were Chilean chilies being sold as Tasmanian cherry, uh, Chilean cherries sold as Tasmanian cherries. Um, and in order to solve this, they simplified the supply chain. So they just chartered flights directly from, um, from Hobart to Southeast Asia. So this worked, we were in a pandemic, we still are in the pandemic. We had disrupted supply lines. The government was really trying to make sure that Australian producers would get their products out. But under normal situations, we can't start having direct flights from farm to market. We live in a global connected supply chain. Australia is an exporting nation. We rely on shipping routes. So this is the, the, um, the global shipping. Sorry, my picture's in the way of that. Um, these are global shipping routes. And I still have the evergreen stuck in the Suez Canal, blocking 12% of global traffic. Although it was freed, finished my slides well in advance of this talk. Um, <laughs> so we can't, we can't rely on these single off solutions. We have to design a system that integrates pro verified provenance so that we can trust our supply chains. We can trust but verify our supply chains. So what we're proposing here um, is we're adding, so we have our trusted supply chain and we have our verified addition onto it where we have a provenance toolbox and a repository. We we're able to collect metrics about agricultural products using different uh, analytical tools and connect that into the supply chain so that any actor in the supply chain can verify the provenance of a product as it moves through the supply chain. This is really simple when, when you have a diagram like this. There's no world that a supply chain is this simple, but this is how we're gonna propose it. So what are we verifying? We talk about verification. These are the metrics or main factors that we're looking at. So adulteration. So that's changing species uh, or the breed uh, or populations. Counterfeit, so it's a proportion of ingredients um, that may, may be substituted for uh, cheaper or alternative sources, types of raw materials. Production standards, so if something is farmed versus wild caught or organic versus conventionally produced, grass fed versus grain fed, geographical origin and different compliance metrics. So all of these target analyses are independent. Those are the characteristics that can be measured and defined and independently verified to determine a product's provenance. So what do we measure? If we can't just go and measure France, we have to use proxies for these. So we're measuring biogeochemical signatures, isotope signals, lipidomic profiles uh, and genomic markers. And we can combine these to create unique fingerprints to define a provenance and verify where a product has come from. So biogeochemical signatures, these can be volatile organic compounds, um, the elemental composition of a product, the isotopes, these are isotope, the stable isotopes, um, the lipidome, these are all your fatty acids and your genomic markers. So SNP profiling, um, or other genomic test measurements. So we'll just take a step back, do a bit of a science lesson to unpack what all of these actually are. So volatile organic compounds. These are compounds that are constantly evaporating so that you can smell or taste them. So this is the, uh, these are the volatile organic compounds of a strawberry. So as a strawberry ripens, its VOC composition will change and its profile will change through the ripening process and also depending on how it was produced. So if you have a, a sweeter strawberry or a more tart strawberry, the VOCs will be different. If we go back looking at cherries, you can compare sour cherries to your uh, sweet cherries and they'll have similar compounds but they'll occur in different concentrations. 
so that you would be able to distinguish not by looking at them, but by their underlying volatile compound, organic compounds. Um, the, the pH changes due to the malic acid uh, in sweet and sour cherries, and even the pits are different. So elemental composition, we can, this is a, we can use uh, tools like the uh, Geochemical Atlas of Australia, where they have done soil surveys and uh, landscape model of yeah, soil surveys across Australia, looking at the different elemental composition of the soil. So this gives an indication of the parent material, the rocks and the soil composition, which some of these elements are contained and retained within a, a food product. And their composition and ratios to one another will be different depending where they're coming from or how they were produced. So here is a study looking at uh, tomato sample, tomatoes but between Italy, Spain, and um, not the EU, and Italian sounding. And they were able to classify them uh, looking at 20 different elements based on their ratios there within. They can separate them out and say that this tomato, Spanish tomato, looks very much different than a non-EU tomato. Isotopes, this is my favorite bit as a, bio, as a isotope biogeochemist. So all atoms um, will have the same number of they have the same number, uh, same atomic number, but have different numbers of neutrons. If you remember how an atom works, you have neutrons, protons, and electrons. If you have different neutrons, they're neutral, but they change the mass. So you'll have a heavier and a light isotope. And this mass difference means that they act differently. Like I'm much slower after I've had a big heavy meal and I've gained a kilo. Um, some isotopes are stable, and that's the ones that we generally use, while others are, are radioactive. So you might have heard of carbon C14 data, carbon-14 data. Uh, carbon-14 is a radioactive uh, isotope, and it constantly decays, so it, it's changing, whereas carbon-13 and carbon-12 are stable, and they're constant. So the extra, extra neuron makes a difference in some reactions because it's heavier, and it's harder to... Um, uh, get up an energy hill. Uh, this results in slower reactions and, and can cause consistent, um, consistent changes. So if we look at, we, can, we have a differentiation of carbon isotopes throughout the world. So tropical grasslands are looking different than deciduous plants. The atmosphere is different. Um, similar with nitrogen, we can look at fertilizers versus atmospheric nitrogen. And we can use this as an animal ecology. So you are what you eat, plus a few per mil. So per mil is the measurement level that you, you look at isotopes. Um, and we are all made of isotopes. Uh, but as you eat, you move up the trophic ladder and your isotopes, uh, your isotopic signature changes. So we can compare a carnivore versus an herbivore or an animal that eats primarily corn versus an animal that eats primarily native grasses. Or a, an Americanized diet, which has a lot of high fructose corn syrup, or an Eastern diet, which is more rice-based. So you can, you can look at these changes in diet um, in somebody's, in anybody's or anything's isotope composition. So the same holds true for water. Um, H2O, so hydrogen has uh, three isotopes. We use the uh, deuterium, so that's two uh, neutrons. And um, oxygen can either be 16 or um, 18. And water is, when it's at the ocean, it's in equilibrium, so it's considered zero. But as it evaporates, the lighter isotopes will evaporate faster into the clouds. And then the heavier isotopes fall out sooner along the coasts. And at, at elevation. So there's a preferential isotope uh, pattern across the continental scales, across land masses, and this is occurring consistently and fairly predictably. So the lipidome, these are all the, the fatty acids we have in our body or in, in cells. So the major components, these are uh, energy stores, they're used for signaling, they're contained in cell membranes. Um, and similar to volatile organic compounds, 
you can use the lipidome and look at the um, concentration and the profile of it to compare fruit, uh, compare foods and classify them uh, based on their production method or how they, uh, yeah, the production method and, and where they're coming from. So this is just a really simple workflow that you can go from a food sample through to the, the mass spec um, and then you get your, uh, your lipidome profile. It's very simple. It's no problem. Anyone can do this. <laughs> um, so you can uh, intersect the lipidome with the proteome or the genome and um, create uh, really unique profiles. And these are uh, influenced by the production process and the environment for where a product was grown or processed. So here's a study where they looked at 155 different agricultural plant products. Um, they did the they did untargeted lipidomics, so they just scanned across the whole lipidome, um, and they were able to separate uh, by based on plant family really well. So if you're looking at constituent ingredients, you would know you know if you're looking at a product made of many constituents, you could look at the lipidome of that product and identify the the constituent ingredients and where they came from. So if you're targeting any um, ingredients or production areas that you want to avoid, you can use this kind of a process. And then genomic markers, this translates the understanding of um, genomes to food provenance. So it accesses existing understanding of genetics, breeding, and, and pathogens, where we can use reduced SNP panels, um, uh, different genomic uh, uh, profiles to identify down to the individual level. So if you want to uh, get away from a breed, but go down further um, to an individual animal or product, you could do that using a, a gene test. So now we'll go back. That was a lot of science <laughs> thrown at you. That was like several different fields. Um, but the important message is that if we're measuring these things consistently, we start to reveal consistent patterns happening across the landscape. And that's what we're after here. So if we look at the, rain, uh, the rainfall isotopes or the groundwater water isotopes um, or the geochemistry of soils, we start to see that we can create regional patterns um, that are consistent over time. And when we stack this information, so this is an isoscape oops, uh, across Australia, you're looking at uh, main precipitation. Uh, it's Australia is a unique case because our weather is not um, patterns, but rather event based because we have the monsoons and we have these big cyclones. So um, it, it makes it a little bit trickier. But we nevertheless, uh, there are still these, these patterns that hold true where you can differentiate uh, based on the water, the precipitation between uh, the north and the south of the country or the continent. So when we stack all of this information, so genetic um, elemental profiles of the soil with water isotopes, um, with uh, proteomes and, and lipidomes, we create neighbor, regional neighborhoods. So these are called terrons from, from terroir, which we've, you may have come across in the wine world. Um, these areas are distinctly different than any other area. So what's red in this map, this is of the Hunter, Hunter Valley, will be chemically different based on the uh, soil and climate patterns than a blue area. And the products contained in these terrons or regional province neighborhoods will look different to one another. So we can use this environmental information to create regional predictions, to create, to understand the, and verify the provenance of any product made and grown in those regions. So what we're working on is creating um, predictive provenance maps, looking uh, at different elements or different layers um, so we're looking at rainfall uh, isoscapes using isotopes of deuterium and oxygen, uh, looking at groundwater, predicting groundwater isoscapes. Uh, we're looking at individual elements and how we can link them all, all together. So linking these together, this is our, uh, we create a, uh, a regional environmental signature. If we match this with a 
predicted agricultural signature, what we can do is then create a model of predictive provenance for any product in any area. And what's really critical is that we maintain the privacy of, of these models and of the data feeding into them. Because we don't want to give out the secret sauce of a production, uh, production process or farming practices, we're really trying to maintain data privacy, but being able to verify this uh, privacy preserved information so that it can flow through the supply chain and we have um, trusted certification and accreditation and, and delivery to the consumer. So what we've come up with is a provenance toolbox um, where you can identify, you know, what's what's your question, so the geographic origin, and then it will identify the probable tests and measurements that you would need to, to verify origin. And the idea behind this is that the data would be is federated so that you can use multiple bits of information. Um, so you don't need to have everything, but you can fill in gaps uh, and um, find uh, reliable proxies using a toolbox so you can still verify with best available information and modeling. So here we have a case study um, where we looked at uh, two years of cherries in New South Wales, Victoria and Tasmania. Um, we did a signature analysis. We used the visible NIR handheld scanner um, to look at the biogeochemical signatures of cherries. So this produces a raw spectra. This is just light bouncing off of the cherry. We're able to transform it and get the information of the biogeochemical signature of the cherries. And we're able to uh, use a multivariate analysis in order to determine the, and separate these cherries based on their geographic origin. So we're able to separate Tasmania, Victoria, and New South, well, New South Wales quite well using these scanners. And then we can feed this information into our uh, privacy preserved sharing module. So we look, we can use in this study, we looked at multiple techniques. So we looked at rapid sensing as well as conventional lab analysis. Um, so this looks at the VOCs of cherries, the volatile organic compounds, and we're able to separate really well down to the region using conventional volatile organic carbon measurements. So we can separate within New South Wales, um, we can separate uh, to smaller regions. And looking at the rapid sensing, we don't have such discrimination down to the region, but we are able to separate at the broader, broader regional scale. Um, and when we compare both seasons, they still separate out well so that we have kind of a, a temporal robustness with our measurements. Additionally, we looked at the isotopes of, um, of water and groundwater and strontium, and we're able to separate as well uh, using these conventional methods. So this kind of demonstrates how we can use three different techniques, come up with the same results, but depending on what's available to, um, in the system, you would be able to choose uh, which technique is most reliable or easily accessible and readily usable for the question you want to ask. And what's really critical is that we want to maintain farmers' data privacy or confidentiality of local information and usefulness throughout the supply chain. So in this study, we developed a um, approvable, so ver verifiable privacy preserved distributed learning model so that we can accurately uh, predict produce provenance. And this is what it looks like. So the data is uh, kind of anonymized or randomized but and maintained anonymous, but you still are able to then separate out and maintain the regional specificity of your provenance without giving away that confidential farmer information of location or production method. So in order for this to work, we need a flow of information um, where this biological repository of, of goods matches with a, a toolbox of methods. Um, so that the producer, the processors, the retailers, and the consumers can all access this information. They may not access it in the same way. Um, standing at the supermarket aisle, I don't really want to know the isotopic composition of all of my cherries. I would never leave because I would be overwhelmed with that amount of data. But I want to, knowing that it's 
exists means that I can have more trust in the labels that I'm currently using. So this may not be something that you ever see as a person, as a you know, rent or a regular consumer, but it changes how agriculture is working. So it's an underpinning infrastructure of sharing information and creating measurements. Um, and in the same way to make this repository work, we need a collaboration between producers, industry bodies, and, and regulatory regulations um, that are feeding into it so that the consumer is empowered to know that all of these, uh, that all of this information is standardized and shared uh, across the supply chain. And these create the big challenges that we have to face. So there needs to be a willingness to share information across the supply chain. This is not at all simple. This is not at all uh, standard ways of working. Um, to have coordinated action across government, industry, and the brands means that this is a whole of, a whole of sector change and a whole of sector solution. And what we're also trying to do is use multi-purpose data. So we're not trying to collect, I mean, in an ideal world, I would love to measure everything always, but farmers are already, and producers or uh, processors are already collecting a lot of data. Um, which isn't always readily accessible to them or to uh, regulate regulators or standards. What we're trying to do is reuse that data in many ways and allow it to be shared uh, for this provenance work as well, as well as an acceptance of standardized methods. So by using a toolbox, we want to uh, adopt many uh, a, a flexible but agnostic way of working so that you can use different methods to come to the same results, but there's an acceptance across these methods. And with that, thanks. And I'll take any questions either live or online. <laughs> Rebecca's gonna moderate the online ones. So anybody online who has questions, please use the Q&A box. And do we have any questions from the audience? Dave? Yep, so we've been looking at kind of machine learning techniques um, to, to fuse that data and to federate it. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so random forest models and yeah. Yep, Martin? That's really great progress, Nina, to see where it's gone. Uh, is, is there still interest from the biosecurity end of town I mean, in terms of, uh, you know, do you remember those discussions over the top land? Yeah, so this feeds into kind of automated compliance as well. Yeah. Um, so there's a, a whole other, so that I, I failed to mention this is part of the CSIRO missions work where we're trying to transform and improve Australian agri-foods exports. So part of that work under the mission is um, creating an automated compliance system where uh, biosecurity information is um, transported through the supply chain seamlessly as well. And this kind of fits in with that. This is seen as an, a module in that, in a way, so that you'd have, you know, the, the information that's being taken for biosecurity would also feed in to verifying provenance because it's also location and welfare standards and um, meeting different codes. Well, particularly the handheld stuff was always something that the department was after, wasn't it? Yep, yep. Okay, um, there's a question from Trevor Garnett. Your methods are great from a forensic perspective, but would a distributed ledger technology based traceability framework mean we didn't need all of this forensic technology? So your uh, distributed ledger is only as good as the information that's going into it. Um, so I think forensic technology is never going to go away because we'll still have independent audits. Um, and if we want to think about this in a global, global way, you're still going to want to have, like in this way, we're having two, a, a parallel supply chain. We have a digital information packet as well as the product moving along. And these two need to match. And this, what we're proposing, provides a link between the digital and the analog, for lack of a better term, of the product itself. So that at any point you can actually verify that that um, what's going along a blockchain or a distributed ledger. And a question from Annie McNeil: Do you see a role for soil or landscape stewardship information in provenance? Yeah, absolutely. So that's actually where my interest came from. Um, I wanted to create a system. Uh, 
it's always tricky to get money for environmental monitoring. Um, but in this way, we're kind of, we have to pay attention to what's going, uh, what's happening with the soils and water. And by giving this, making this information more readily available and accessible, we're giving the producers uh, control and empowering them to make data-driven decisions and improving their um, stewardship as well. So in an ideal world, you would be taking information from um, natural resource managers throughout the Murray Darling Basin as they're doing their monthly grab samples <coughs> that would feed into this because all of that, the water flowing down downstream feeds into the irrigation systems. So it becomes kind of a, a, a byproduct of this is a, an environmental monitoring tool. Uh, what's like the input that the consumer might actually see there and I don't know, a seal or label or anything that the consumer will actually going to see that on the, on the final product? So that's not where my my work goes to it, it could be it could be that you know like a retailer takes this on and says any packet anything that's coming off of our shelves has a verified provenance so you can trust any product and then you're kind of you're making that decision based on where you shop if you're going to choose retail a versus retail b because you know that they have that system um, there could be potential, so this is seen as an underpinning technology, and there could be potential that other companies come in and, you know, they add their own information so that you can, uh, you know, it becomes visible uh, where the product is from, or, you know, you can see some test results or something like this. Um, but the information has to be there in order for that system to work. And it has to be more than a marketing tool, so that it's more than a QR code you scan and you get the marketing video of a farmer. Um, which you may or may not trust. Presumably, you're building another customer in the database that this needs to be used. So, can other companies be interested in that? The methods that might be employed in the supply chain, so you can see how that might be used in a cloud-based system. Yeah. So that's the yeah that's the idea that this is kind of uh, cloud-based, but there's a there needs to be an independent but. So open source, but not open to the world in a way, kind of this controlled access um, so that you may not see the data behind it, but you can verify the verification that data set A matches with data set Z. That verification is then visible at an open source. So there's different ways to um, go about putting the data out there so that you retain it may be cloud based, um, but then the, yeah, and then the links are also then open source. So that's it. So we're, we're exploring a lot of um, optical sensors at the moment. So VIZ, NIR, and XRF um, technologies and trying to develop proxies for those. So there's a, a whole effort uh, in, with regards to developing a uh, spectroscopy service so that we would create like, the back end that you can, um, that all of the data necessary is, is curated and maintained in, in a standardized and methodological verifiable way so through a trusted advisor um, but yeah also this kind of opens up opportunities for other additions so if you're looking at ear tags on livestock um, they can be used in the system and that information stored in the cloud can be accessed uh, so you have geolocation you have access to water you have feed uh, information as well it's quite muddled when you get up into the, it's not my area of expertise, but part of the project, um, uh, part of the team is working on this. So thinking about this, then I have a flavor technology that gets deployed into the supply chain as a testing tool and it's yep. for non-specialists to utilize that. So do you have a feeling for what might be the case? No, not at the moment. So we're trying to develop, we're trying to take like this visit of his NIR out of the lab and onto the production board. So there's there has been a lot of success in the minerals world for this in different ore products. So we're trying to take learnings from them um, and translate that onto into the agricultural pack houses. Yeah, so that's part of it, but that's not so much what we're looking at at the moment. But it, there's there is definitely opportunity, and this isn't we can't do everything. So it's kind of you know 
we're hoping that this also opens up new opportunities for other other sensors and as it develops and other questions come up that you can add into it and it's all it becomes a, a networked oh great oh that'd be fantastic i'd be very keen to follow up with that That'd be great. Hopefully, I have a post that coming down the track. <laughs> okay, any more questions or any more questions online? Okay, well, if you can all join with me to thank Nina for a fantastic thank presentation. Thank you. And thank you everyone for attending. So.